Hey everyone, we've got a special treat at the end of the podcast. We have a new theme song. Well, George Conway, he's a man with a plan. Got to sit down with Sarah Longwell, take a stand. We're testing out for the pod, so give it a listen and let us know what you think. So the judge in this case just issued an expanded gag order, barring Trump from talking publicly about his own family. He behaves in many, many respects like a mob boss. He lacks sufficient self-control to be able to comply with these orders, I think. And the question is, what do you do when he ultimately crosses the line? Which actually probably has what already. What do they do? Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. And because I am not a lawyer, I've asked my good friend George Conway from the Society for the Rule of Law to explain the legal news to me roughly every week. Before we get started, I wanted to let folks know that we're hosting a live taping. Did you know this of our podcast in Nobody Washington, D.C.? This. Yeah, this put it was on not your disclosed. calendar. Put okay. it on your calendar. Washington, D.C. on May 15th at 6th and I. Where? At 6th and I. Where? That's <laughs> that's a place. It's a location. Oh. It's both a, it's both Who's an on address. First? It's both an address and a physical What's on location. Second? I don't know who's on third. If you live in D.C., you know 6th and I. Tickets are still available, so come see us. Oh, I did know that. Yeah, you know that. Yeah. We're going to do this. We're yeah. going to do it for all the people. Okay. Six uh, to nine, yes. JBL and Tim. I thought you were saying, I thought you said six to nine. I'm just I'm spaced out today, but. Uh, we'll do, we'll do, uh, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a double feature of me where uh, we do Sarah and George and then we do TNL. We don't fill that place. It's kind of big. <laughs> no, it's really big. It's actually intimidating. Honestly, if you've already come to see us, just uh, you should pity come see us one more time. We'll pay you to it's... come. <laughs> we, 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 we We don't want to be like a, a Trump rally. Uh, yeah, that's right. We need to fill the place up. Yeah. Uh, so actually, before we start with uh, legal news, uh, we've got two housekeeping items. Okay. The first is that you, you, you've decided that we have merch. We have merch. Yes. You want to show people the merch? Well, this is the merch. I mean, this was the draft merch. Yeah, I had these made on my own. It's been an iterative process. And then this is the final merch with bigger lettering so that even, you know, a psycho could read it. Yeah. And um, it says, vote for Joe, not the psycho. And here is a draft bumper sticker that I personally made. And, and I'm going <laughs> to try to prevail on you. Graphic design is your passion. It's not hard. It's just basically you pick the colors <laughs> and the font. The font yeah. is key. It's got to be sure. a serif font. Yeah. And, um, you know, this one is a little fancier because it's got the J down there. But it's, it's fine. It works. It works. It's, uh, you know, I like if these. You, if you I wanna... think this is the slogan that's going to, this is going to be like Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Yeah. People that's are going to, 200 years from now, people are going to say, wow, whoever invented that slogan, vote for Joe, not the psycho, he was a real genius. Yeah. A stable genius. And you came up with that because you did. called me the day you thought you were very excited about this I slogan. I was very excited. Yeah. Uh, and so it's great. I mean, I, it, I, would, I would do Eminem proud. <laughs> okay. All so right. if you want to get the, this hat, we're going to put the, the little link. In the show notes or at the bottom of the YouTube. And I don't really don't know. Don't be There's afraid know how to, to do that. wear it everywhere. Let them get mad at you. Oh, man. Okay, here's the other thing I want to talk about. This is actually the bigger deal. Bigger deal? Okay. You gave almost a million dollars to Joe Biden this week. It, like, made news. Well, not you were personally, trending Not on personally. Twitter. It's not like I'm paying for his legal fees. That's <laughs> true. But you gave it to his what? His campaign? The Biden Victory Fund, which is a combined fundraising entity that consists of the campaign and um, the national party, the Democratic Party, and a bunch of state parties and so on and so forth. And so you can give, they allocate it in some way. So you gave the maximum the allowable maximum number. maximum allowable by law, Which yes. is actually a weird number. 929,600. And I think it's got something to do with federal, the intersection of federal and state laws. I, I have no idea. But when you get these... When you get these things, I mean, I remember the, the Trump, there was every, every year of presidential campaigns send these out and they have these joint fundraising vehicles for the presidential campaign that combines um, fundraising for the parties and for the state parties and for the campaign. And, and they come up with some maximum number that's based upon, you know, the federal limits and the state, state limits. And um, that and was You were like, one. I'm going for the limit. Give me the top. Yeah. I mean, um, Talk about why it was important for you to do that. Like, what well, is it? Well, I mean, I, th I mean, it was. I, I was asked to do the, the fundraiser to headline the fundraiser, and I said, "Sure, yeah, I'll you know whatever you whatever you guys want, um, I'll do. I'll carry people on my back 
um, barefoot on broken glass, the poles on, on November 5th if I have to. And uh, so I said, I'd do the fundraiser. And then I'm looking at the invitation. And I was like, whoa, yeah, my name's big words there. And I read the whole thing. And I guess, oh, I, have to, I should give something. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, okay, what's the, I can give five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Well, maybe I should get 50. I don't know. And I thought about it. It's like, this is the most important thing that I could ever give money to in my life. Um, I hope they spend it wisely. I, I, I tr I'm going to trust them to. It's, I mean, this is like, okay, so this comes out of maybe uh, it comes out of my children's inheritance, right? Mm. But what could they, what, what more of a bequest can we give them than a functioning constitutional republic and you know I, I thought about that and and um I, I, that's how why i decided to do it and I, at that point there was no question i was going to do that and i you know it's more than <clears throat> i ever have given probably in the aggregate to political candidates or to frankly even charities i'm sure um in my entire life um uh, but i mean this is for all the marbles it really is, and um, I don't want to be emotional about it, but it, it really, everybody needs to, I mean, do what, anybody out there, just do what you can, okay? It doesn't have to be writing a check to the, to the Biden Victory Fund or um, doing, it, it's just whatever you can, you, you need, people need to do, whether it's just talking to their neighbors, um, making a recurring donation for a dollar or two or something i don't know whatever you whatever you can do th this is so important i can't i can't I, I words can't describe it and and um i i just my own my hope is that uh i can get a few people to do the same um or not the same or but get people to give a little more than they otherwise would have because it's really important i do think if you're a democratic donor and somebody like you who's given I would say if you've looked back at your the history of your giving, it is mostly to Republicans. Uh, I, I think it's basically ninety nine percent of Republicans. Once I get, <laughs> once my former former law partner Bernie Nussbaum, remember him? He was the White House counsel, first White House counsel in the Clinton administration. Um, may yeah. he rest in peace. Um, he was a big dem. He was a friend of Hillary's. Um, uh, he once got me to give two hundred dollars to attend some luncheon in his honor. You know, for the Demo state Democratic Committee yeah, in New sure. York, and that was basically the only time I ever gave money to a Democrat. Yeah, um, to Democrats. Um, but this isn't about this isn't about. I don't I don't view this as giving money to Democrats. I give this. This is this is for the country. This is about the country. It's not. I mean, there's there's you know there there's a there's a rational there is the rational and the irrational. There's the hateful and the uh, constructive and we're we're being forced to cho choose between an abyss that we can't we can't even see the bottom of because it keeps getting worse and worse and worse um and normality and that's what this is about yeah and if so if you're a democratic donor uh i'm gonna shame them all <laughs> yeah, into giving been... more than they ever have to. if this schmuck ass republican who voted for trump exactly. in 2016 can write this effing check guys come on all you rich limousine liberals, get to it. All right. All right. All right. Okay, let's start down in Florida with Jack Smith and his filing in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. That was something. So we talked about this last episode, but just to remind folks, Judge Cannon asked both parties to submit proposed jury instructions based on two, and I think the technical term is bananas, formulations right. of the law. Uh, and those were... Both due on April 2nd, so we're taping on April 3rd. No, we're taping on April 4th, so this is a couple days ago. So before we get to the substance of the party's filings this week, can you just remind us what was so odd for Judge Cannon? Like, why it was so odd for her to do this in the first place? Uh, it was prompted by motions to dismiss by Trump, in which they made various bananas arguments. And, and the, the principal argument that comes to mind is this argument that was not the product of any brilliant legal mind. It was the product of this fellow from Judicial Watch who uh, is not a lawyer, who basically- The guy with the arms? The guy, yes, yes, the guy's arms. I get his arm. direct mail requests. Yes, yes, you know, he, uh, he, he must have dropped a weight on his head or something, but um, 
he his he misread there was this case in the 1990s involving Bill Clinton. And Clinton met with a historian. Taylor Branch, was it? I think. Um, Why are you looking at me? Like, I would know. I don't know. You, you, uh, you're like an encyclopedia. But anyway, <laughs> so, so he meets with a, a historian, and, and, and they tape you know, his thoughts about things that are going on so that this guy can write a book. And he gets a copy of these cassettes, and he takes the cassettes to his private residence upstairs in the White House, and he puts it in his socks drawer. And so later, somebody, the Judicial Watch actually, um, filed, or some, maybe it wasn't Judicial Watch, somebody filed a, a, a request or some, made some claim that the, these materials were presidential records. Mm -hmm. And it was litigated in the United States District Court here in, in Washington. And the court basically held, no, these were personal these were personal records under on the PRA, the Presidential Records Act. And the Presidential Records Act basically says that presidential records, meaning stuff you use in the course of doing business as president, things that go to the president from staff and things that, you know, where he responds to that or things that have something to do with his actual working um, are presidential records. And so the issue here was, well, okay, he's, recount he's recounting events to a historian about things that he did in office, but this wasn't for the purpose of his work. It was for the purpose of the, of the historian's work. And, you know, maybe he was going to use that for his own personal diary someday or whatever. And the court basically said, this doesn't fall within the presidential records definition of the President Records Act. Somehow, this fellow from Judicial Watch Tom Fitton is his Tom name? Tom Fitton. Tom good, Fitton. Good yes. pull. Yeah, I keep thinking of the guy in the 90s who sued his mother. I've never mind. Uh, you remember him, right? No. Forget it. Okay, I'm just dating myself. But anyway, he, um, he twists this opinion into saying that the president can basically say whatever he wants is personal. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if he, he can get a, and to the point where the Trump people are arguing that he, that the, the, the president could get a, document with the nuclear codes on it and say, oh, this is personal. <laughs> right. And, and, and is so, this like the declassify with my mind it's type it, thing? But it's even worse because it's, it's even worse than the declassify with his mind thing because at least the declassification, you know, the, the, the declassification with his mind, um, it doesn't change who owns the property. This uh -huh. is like literally saying that he can decide that the property of the United States of America, in, in, in the property interest of the United States of America in a document that, say, reflects our deepest, most important nuclear secrets or, or intelligence information, that he can just make it personal. Right. And that's just insane. Right. It, and it's, and, 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 and more, more than the point, not, it's not just insane, it's just completely inconsistent with the definitions that are right up front in the Presidential Records Act. But anyway, so... Trump makes a motion, Trump and his lawyers make a motion to dismiss the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida before our friend Judge Cannon. And she issues some mealy mouth decision saying, ooh, this is kind of hard. Mm, they say this and these I say that. And we'll have to, I'll have to see. We'll, we'll see what the facts show at trial, which is nonsense because this is a pure issue of law. It's not, there is no evidence to be weighed on this. The documents fit the, either fit the definition of presidential records, which they do unquestionably because they are things that the, were presented to the president in connection with his official duties. It doesn't even matter whether or not they're classified, frankly. Mm -hmm. It's just if he gets a memo from a staffer and it relates to some business in the White House, uh, in the government, that is a presidential record. And it belongs to the United States of America. It belongs to you and I, you and me. Well, we don't, so, I don't, I'm not classified, well, I mean, well, classified you know, status. In our, but, you know. in our capacity as citizens, yeah, okay, right. I don't mean I gotcha. personally, but, but it, it, it is the property of the United States of America. And so the notion that she's even entertaining this is a dangerous thing for a couple of reasons. One, it's wrong. And secondly, if she, she should be denying this motion to di dismiss. If she denies the motion to dismiss, it's fine. If she grants the motion to dismiss now, then, which she didn't, she, the, the, Jack Smith could take it up to the 11th Circuit and get it reversed. But if in the middle of a trial, she declares, so let's say the government rests its case and she says, I find that the government as a matter of law has not proven these to be presidential records, that judgment can't be appealed because of 
the double jeopardy prohibition in the Constitution. Once jeopardy attaches, meaning once the jury is sworn in, essentially, if the court directs a verdict in favor of the defendant, the government cannot appeal, even if what the court has done is completely bananas. And so basically, that was one problem here, was that, mm -hmm. huh, she's saying this is a factual issue? It's not even a factual issue. It's not even close to a factual issue. It's a pure, simple issue of law, and it's black and white, and only, only a person who can't read or, doesn't, or is insane would say otherwise, that, that, that somehow the president can just declare um, a book about you know the, the the nuclear codes in the in in the football that the that the a that the military a you know, president can declare that to be those those are personal records those are my personal nuclear I'm codes. Them home. yeah I'm taking them home with me yeah to Mar-a-Lago and 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 you know it, it's just insane but the other thing that she did after she denied the motion to dismiss or deferred it to the trial was she asked for proposed jury instructions. Now, it's a little early to do jury instructions. Normally, you do that closer to the trial, which she doesn't seem to be inclined to hold anytime soon. But she asked for instructions that incorporated the ridiculous, absurd, insane construction or non-construction, if you will, of the Presidential Records Act that was advanced by, you know, Tom, uh, the Tom Fitton theory as, as, it, as endorsed by Trump. And this is like... You, you're asking the government to write, to propose jury instructions. You're asking both sides, but the government to propose jury instructions that are completely inconsistent with the government's position on the law and consistent, completely inconsistent with the text of the act. And it's just completely insane. So what Jack Smith did is he complied with, with, the, with, the, with the request, the order by the court to produce such draft jury instructions. And he basically, he, I mean... In tone, it's a very lawyerly document. It's a very lawyerly submission, but it really kind of it it, it mocks her. I mean, yeah. it's like it's it's a it's a piece of writing. It's a, it's a brilliant piece of writing. The tone is respectful, but it just mocks her. And what it does is, it's it it, it wrote jury instructions, and jury instructions are usually structured this way. They they make a few preliminary. Um, premises they, they they say to the jury that you know there are classified records and they're done by like this or there are presidential records and they're defined as that and and does that sort of boilerplate stuff and then it, it what what they did is they wrote the proposed instructions like with correct statements of law at the beginning and then they said in spite of this i instruct you to find you know to make this finding that is completely inconsistent with what we just said the law was. And they did, that's the technique they used basically to just show her, try to show her and the world how ridiculous um, what, she, what she was asking for was. So and, do you think she is so shamed? Is she shamed by this? Or did, did she know what she was doing? Because the whole thing is just a tactic to like get this thing delayed and kicked around. Well, I, I have come to the conclusion that she is in... She's in so far over her head. Yeah. Right. I, I think she's completely incompetent, to tell you the truth. I mean, her, she writes English sentences that sometimes seem like they make sense, but she, she, she's just utterly, completely incompetent. This woman should not be a federal judge. And, and you can see that just in the way she's conducted these proceedings and in the fact that she's, just, she's actually falling behind. She can't keep up with the work. Um, and there, there are just so many things that are just piling up. And I, and I think, you know, I mean, part of it may be that she does have some motivation or some skepticism about the prosecution or motivation to help Trump. Um, maybe she, maybe it's personal ambition or otherwise, but she's not very good at it. Yeah. Okay. If you were, if you were going to help Trump, you'd just not do any, you wouldn't do some of this sh shit, so to speak. You wouldn't be doing these absurd things. You would just slow it down. That's how you, that's how you, 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 you do things. And so I think it's a combination of, um, Maybe she has a bad motive, or maybe she has a bias. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm always, I don't like to say that judges are corrupt. Uh, I, I will say when they are completely stupid that they are stupid. Yeah. And th this judge is, I mean, I wouldn't do it if I were practicing, uh, <laughs> but she, th this, is, this is just stupidity on her part. She doesn't, does, does not know what, what she's doing. She doesn't even know how to help the guy. Um, that said, um, she can do a lot of damage, and... Um, and one of the things that, that is important about this submission that Jack Smith uh, made the other day is it basically said, they said to, to Judge Cannon, look, Judge, if you're going to do this, 
I mean, we disagree with you when we think it's ridiculous. I mean, didn't quite use that language, but pretty much that's what they're saying. You better tell us now, sooner rather than later, because we're going to take you up to the Court of Appeals. Because we can't have this happening close to trial or during yeah. the trial. And so basically, they're just, they're, they threw down the gauntlet. And, and they're basically saying, you know, one, one, we're, we're ready to take you up. And I have to say, I mean, there is, it's a very difficult thing to throw a judge off a case for being biased. Um, and if, it, it, it's almost impossible. But sometimes you can get a court of appeals um, I've seen it happen in the Second Circuit, where a judge makes so many mistakes in one direction and is so screwed something up that the Court of Appeals just says, um, we reverse and we remand and we direct the, the chief judge to, of the district court to assign this case to another judge. Yeah. And that's, it, it's like, it, it's a very, very, it's very, very insulting to the lower court judge. So they don't like to do that to their, to their colleagues. But in, in the, the 11th Circuit, I'm told, by mavens of 11th Circuit practice, 11th Circuit is the circuit of the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals that covers the states, the great states of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Um, the 11th Circuit, it, there's sort of like an unwritten three strikes rule, as I understand it, that if, you, if the court, district court judge does something that's completely wild three times in, 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 in sort of the wrong direction, um, they, 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 they will strongly consider taking somebody off the case. And basically, she's done that already. Yeah. So this could be, if she, if she persists, um, this could be strike three. And, and, and at this point, you know, one of the things that, that you have to consider when you are a lawyer and you've got a judge who you think is just stacking the deck against you. And I mean, legitimately think that, not like the way that Trump thinks that everybody's stacking the deck against him, even though, you know, he brings it all on himself by being a criminal. Um. You, you, you hesitate to make the motion because it's like if you lose, it's, it's like the old adage, if you shoot at the king, you better not, better not miss. Mm -hmm. And it's, you better not miss when you're trying to take out a district judge. Unless, of course, you're just trying to create a record for an appeal. Um, but here there wouldn't be an appeal if she does what they, the, the, the worst scenario would be to direct a verdict during the trial, which would be unappealable. But anyway, so it's a very tricky thing when you are a litigant, whether civil or or criminal, whether you be the United States of America or any or, or an ordinary litigant, whether it be a civil litigant or a criminal defendant, it's a very tricky calculus because you 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 need to you need to succeed. Here, the other piece of the calculus is that delay. Mm -hmm. it, it, any any anything that if you try to take her off the case or you try to take um, a, a a a one of these pretrial rulings up to the Court of Appeals. And there's not normally an appeal route for some of this stuff. Um, the route is, it's not, it's not technically appealable under the ordinary appellate statutes, but there is something called mandamus, a writ of mandamus, which essentially says, this judge is not doing her job. Mm. Okay, she's off the wall. So judge, the Court of Appeals, you need to order this judge to do her job. And that's what, you know, and that's a very, very tough high standard. But if, if they did that here, I mean, I think they're pretty, I think they could get it. I think one of the considerations is all, all, it would, of del, would be delay because it would take a while, it would take a few weeks, but they're not going to get this case tried this year anyway, yeah. I suspect at this point. Yeah. Um, and so at some point, if she, per, I, I think the next time she twitches the wrong way and does something that they can take up, like if she, I don't know, I mean, the next time she does something, there's a pretty good chance, I think, that Jack Smith will seek a writ of mandamus and then try to get her kicked off the case. And that will be, you know, that'll be the most important um, piece of litigation in the case. But if Donald Trump wins the election, will any of that even matter? No. If Donald Trump back? wins the election, these cases all go away. Yeah, right. Hey, just... We went deep there on Jack as, as do we. We will go away. We will be writing you from New Zealand <laughs> yeah. or Guantanamo right. or you know Antarctica. Yeah, Antarctica would maybe be safe. He wouldn't find we us will, there. We will podcast from wherever we go. Yes. Uh, hopefully, we're we will need a big together. satellite dish. Yeah. Uh, what did Trump's filing have anything interesting? Like he had to do the same thing Jack Smith did, right? I. Like, you know, I didn't read yeah, it and I didn't hear sure anything it's about fine. it. It's, it's like, fine, whatever. you know, I mean, it was same, I mean, the same old, same old BS. Okay. So, moral of the story, there's still a long way to go. A long way to go. That, that. that is not, that case is, yes, that, that case, I know, I know, I have 
given up hope that that case, this case is going to get tried anytime soon. It's a 2025 case. It is still, I mean, if, look, I mean, th this is the best case against Trump um, just on the merits. It's just they have him dead to rights. Yeah. They have him dead to rights. And these are, there are multiple counts under the Espionage Act and each of these, there's 10 year maximum on each of these counts of, of under the Espionage Act. And then there's obstruction. There's no question. He, he is, he's the closest thing to guilty as a matter of law than you could get. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, well, I mean that, there's no her, such concept, but that, that she's done her job for him then. Right. Cause it's, yeah, it's, I mean, but not a, not in a competent way, but yeah, right. yeah, yeah. She's bumbled her way. And I think she's, you know, I mean, I, I, th I think this is a very interesting character study of her. I think she's, I think she's a very stubborn, resentful person who, 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 who who's going to be difficult to deal with for them. I mean, yeah. I, I just think she, I, she doesn't know what she's doing and then she's, she's got a chip on her shoulder and she's probably angry at all the criticism that, that, that is being thrust in her direction by people like us. Um, you, you know that type of person. I mean, you, you see these judges from time to time. They're the worst judges. They're the judges who have a chip on their shoulder and who are angry and have a, have a bias. And I think that's where, I think that's what we have here. And, and um, it's not good. Yeah. He got very lucky getting, getting this charge. Her. Yeah. Hey guys, a little breaking news to insert into the pod here. After we finished recording, Judge Eileen Cannon did deny Trump's motion to dismiss. So that is good news based on the discussion we were having. And I hope you're enjoying the pod. Stick with it. OK, we got to pay some bills. And because you have given all your money away, uh, you know, we got to we got to we got to get some more uh, here. So George is going to do his first ad. My first ad. I'm going to do my best. Um I'm inspired by listening to baseball on the radio as a kid. I grew okay. my radio voice. And Sarah, this is my first ad read. Are you excited? I am excited. Okay, I'm good. excited. All right. Today's episode is sponsored by The Perfect Gene. And Sarah, the best thing about this ad is that we're allowed to swear. And so please swear whenever you like. Okay. Um, I don't know who wrote that. I'm not that. the one who swears on I don't this write show. That. I'm the one who swears. Yeah. What am I talking about? As for our sponsor, The Perfect Gene makes... Great looking, perfect fitting jeans that are as comfortable as sweatpants. And this is actually a true thing. Yeah, you're wearing I am them wearing right them. now, they right? They sent me a pair and I'm wearing them. And these are actually, no, no shit. These are, <laughs> these, are the, these are the most comfortable pairs, the pair of jeans I've ever had. And um, I was sent a pair and I safely said they fit me perfectly and are incredibly comfortable. Okay, I said that already. Here's their secret. They use a special denim fabric that's soft and has the perfect amount of stretch so that you can squat, do yoga, or sit around reading legal news and tweeting. <laughs> Which is what, anybody, do you, do you yoga think of anybody? <laughs> yeah, I don't do yoga. I do. Yeah, I, tweeting doesn't really require me to kick my leg up like that, you know. But, but um, look how look, look at that. Look at I was able to do what that. you could do uh, in these yeah. jeans. <laughs> yeah, my hamstrings not so much, but but my jeans are okay. They make six different fits and have waist sizes from twenty six to fifty. Huh. No, I no longer have those. And lengths from 26 to 38. So they've got you covered. We should send some pairs. We should send pairs to Mount Lago. Yeah. Huh? Okay. And for a limited time, our listeners get 15% off their first order, plus free shipping at theperfectgene.nyc. You can just Google the perfect gene and use code AskGeorge15 for 15% off. And Sarah, it can be a real struggle to find a pair of jeans that fit just right. Mm. I always dread when I have to get new ones, and, but now I don't have to worry about that because I have the perfect jean. They also have t-shirts. I want to check those out. So it's finally time to ditch uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectgene.nyc. That's theperfectgene.nyc. Our listeners get 15% off your first order, plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use the code Ask George 15, ask George 15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc with promo code ask George 15. And after you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about the perfect gene. And please support our show and tell them we sent you. All right. Now let's talk about hush money. Hush. Money. Hush. Let's move on. I want to talk about porn stars. To the election interference case in New York, Trump has asked yet again for this case to be porn star hush postponed. money case. I just, prefer, I mean, let's just let's just get real here. Don't why do let you liked the election interference framing? Uh, you know, I, it's fine. It is election interference, but 
But you like uh, saying porn star? Yes. Okay. That's fair enough. I mean, Donald Trump paid off hush money, paid hush money to a porn star, and she didn't stay hushed. I think that's, I just love saying that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, think about that. Is that the art of the deal? Not a good deal. It was not a good deal. And, $130,000. Uh, Plus, he had, to, he had to gross up the taxes for, for Michael Cohen. I'm surprised And then the he got indicted so for it. So, am I getting in trouble? Trump, once again, he wants this case to be postponed. He's asking again. So, this it's time, funny. he claims there's for, too for much. For somebody who's so innocent, he doesn't want to go to trial. Why is that? Well, he keeps saying there's too much pretrial publicity oh. and it's prejudicing them against them, which is funny because, and Bragg's office made this case that they oppose Trump's motion, huh. uh, obviously. Where's the publicity but I coming read, from? I want to read, yeah, right. I want to read part of Bragg's filing. Defendant's own incessant rhetoric is generating significant publicity, and it would be perverse to reward defendant with an adjournment based on media attention he is actively seeking. This just feels like classic Trump, right? Acting Absolutely. like the victim in circumstances right. entirely of his own making. Right. Yeah. It's the classic um, Darvo, where you deny... And then it, we, you, it, it, Darvo is this, is this psychological term where you... Um, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. Oh. And that's basically what he does all the time. And here he's basically saying, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong and when he is, mm -hmm. and then accusing the other side of doing it and then claiming to be the victim. Yeah. So that, that's essentially what he does. That's, that's the classic narcissist um, approach to everything. Uh, so this is, this is, he's not going to get this one, right? No, this no. judge is not going to give him it's ridiculous, and and the and the other good point that the that the prosecution makes is this publicity isn't going to go away. Any this case this case is going to have a certain amount of publicity no matter what happens, and and you combine that with the argument that um, that uh, he's causing most of the publicity. It, it, it's it, there's just no argument here, and and the fact of the matter is there are. They'll just, it just means that the jury selection has to be done in a certain way. You have to interview the jurors. You have to ask them questions. And it, they're going to do the best they can. And that you know, most cases do not get postponed or moved or anything like that for no matter how much publicity there was. And sometimes, you, you, you know, uh, I mean, I remember there was one case when I clerked. No, not before when I clerked. When I, when I was in law school, they had this big, big New York City scandal involving the Parking Violations Bureau. And basically every major politician other than Ed Koch got, got in trouble. And the defense moved for a change of venue because of the extensive publicity. I mean, it was literally in the papers every day, every time somebody would go into the grand jury. And so the judge said, okay, fine. I'm going to go to Connecticut and we'll try the case in Connecticut. And so they basically had a bunch of Connecticut homemakers and, you know, just people who were sh completely shocked. Don't read the New York Post every day and guilty all, all along. Sometimes yeah. he gets your one. But here, he, he, he does, he doesn't, he's not asking for change of venue. He's asking to put this off. He doesn't want to be tried in any court, anytime, anywhere. Because um, he knows he's guilty. Yeah, but he won't get this one. So he's talking about it so much, though. This is like... Well, there, it's not just that he's talking about it. He's basically just, he's using it. He's using the opportunity to attack the judge's daughter. Well, this is family. it. This yeah. is what I, so the judge in this case just issued an expanded gag order. Right. Uh, because last week the judge issued a gag order barring Trump from talking publicly about the witnesses, the court staff, and the jurors. And then this week the judge had to expand it the gag order to include his own family, right. the judge's family, and the district attorney's family after Trump started personally attacking the judge's daughter. You have a take on this? Because I've seen some of our conservative pals, even ones that are like not always the worst, suggest that the gag orders on Trump are, you know, like obliterating his First Amendment uh, or something. Uh, uh, he's, look, it, it, you and I can say anything we want about anybody because we're not the defendant. He is awesome. a criminal defendant. His trial is at issue here. The integrity of his trial is at issue here. And he does not have the same rights to speak um, as other people with respect to matters pertaining to the trial and the people participating in the trial. And he abuses you know, his right of free speech by attacking people and trying to intimidate people. I mean, the, the danger is that, that, that witnesses will be intimidated, even if, even if he doesn't attack the witnesses themselves. I mean, what, or, or, or jurors. I mean, a juror or a witness will go into that courtroom and think, oh, he can say all this stuff about the judge's daughter? I mean, 
he's going to take after me if I find him guilty or if I testify. Wait till after the trial. He's going to go after me. And it can be very, you know, it, it, that has an intimidating effect and it's intentional. Yeah. I mean, that's just what he does. So he does not have the right to do any of these things. And he's going to push, continue to push the envelope. And he, 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 lacks, um, he lacks sufficient self-control to be able to comply with these orders, I think. And the question is, what do you do when he ultimately crosses the line? Which actually he probably has what already. What do they do? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, there, 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 are, there are sanctions sh- short of throwing him into, uh, in, into the lockup in the tombs in Manhattan or Rikers or whatever. Um, they, you know, he, he, there's a, there's, he, the judges has suggested that he might prevent Trump I don't know whether he would include the lawyers in this from learning the identities of the jury, which I think he ought. I mean, a New York New York law may say differently, but I, you, if you remember in the Eugene Carroll case, which was under you know federal procedural rules, um, the judge made the jury anonymous mm. so that neither side, including including Robbie Kaplan and her people in Eugene Carroll, neither side knew the names of the jurors. They were all identified by numbers, and then the judge said when when the, when he, in both jury for both, for both jury trials when he discharged the juries, he said, "My advice to you is don't tell anybody you were on this jury." Mm. And we don't even know, to this day, we don't know who these jurors are. We know little bits and pieces about them, but we don't know their identities. Um, that seems like a good practice. It is a good practice. It's a, and it's a practice usually never seen in civil cases. It's seen in basically mob cases, well, yeah, mob, mob cases, RICO cases in, in federal court. And basically his behavior is he's even worse than a mob boss. The, ju- the mob bosses, you know, they usually don't, they don't try to attack or intimidate the cops Mm -hmm. or the judge. They kind of know not to do that because even though they're probably psychopaths, they're not completely insane. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump has no such inhibitions, which tells you a lot about Donald Trump. So, um, you know, he he behaves in many, many respects like a mob boss. He, He demands that kind of loyalty. He acts like he's not constrained by rules and he isn't. So, you know, I mean, he ought to be Constrained by rule, the very kinds of protections that um, the court system gets and imposes uh, when a mob boss is tried, I think should apply to him. All right. I want to turn quickly to the New York business case because Trump did manage to post that 170 million bond this week. Apparently, California billionaire Don Hankey footed the bill. Hankey? Hankey. Hankey. Like as in hanky panky. Hanky, hanky panky. Uh, hanky said that the bond was a good business deal, and he's charging Trump a modest fee. Doubtful. Uh, I mean, doubtful that it's a good business deal. Uh, so the Bosch from the Washington Post. Trump has gained stays in the two most daunting civil cases against him without having to forfeit any of his assets or sell any of his properties, nor did he have to touch stock he has in his social media company, Trump Media and Technology Corp Group. A uh, stake that was still valued around $4 billion Tuesday afternoon despite the stock's price's recent slide. It looks like Trump dodged all those bullets yeah, I mean, once look, again. Uh, again, no? I, yeah, he did it. He did it, and in, 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 but I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing uh, for the reasons I said last week. Um, the purpose of the security requirement, the bond requirement, is to protect the interests of the judgment creditor. E. Jean Carroll, in the case of of the civil defamation right. rape case, and then the state of New York in the A. G. case. And if he could not post the bond in either case, then the judgment would be unsecured. And there wouldn't be wh- – what's going to happen now is if Jean, e. Jean Carroll wins on appeal, which she, I'm pretty confident she will, um, she will the, the $83.3 million, $83. million will be dispersed by Chubb, by Chubb's federal insurance subsidiary, um, to her within a matter of days. The yeah. money is there. There is no question. She will get that money if she wins. Similarly, with respect to the $175 million bond um, that was issued by whatever Hanky Panky is, assuming he's good for it, I, I have no reason to believe he isn't good for it, um, the, the state's going to get that $175 million. Um, because Hanky Panky will be on the line for it, and be, 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 be the, 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 he, he is committed to and that. And so, when he says a modest fee, so what? Trump pays him back with a little interest. That's no, uh, usually there's a there's an upfront fee, like okay. like you know, like when you when you take out a mortgage, there's an origination fee, 
and I, there there is some kind of I don't know the business model and I don't know the I don't know the economics of it. But it, this guy you know, made all his money just by the way providing high interest loans to people in dire economic circumstances yeah. who wanted to buy a car. Like yeah. that was his business model, yeah. so he'd try them hard. I find that to be like a little bit funny. That that's the person and like he basically taking a high a risk use, a used car financer but, yeah, yeah taking on a, a high risk client who doesn't pay his uh, yeah, yeah I mean the, Trump well, who would buy a used car from Donald Trump many uh, people say many people say anyway so um yeah so the state is guaranteed the one seventy five unless hanky panky goes bankrupt or something um and that's good for the state and and it's good for the state in another way it means that the, they don't have to send out lawyers to go out and chase down these assets, which would have been a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, it would have been difficult and a nightmare for Trump, which is what some people want to see. And people were dis- a lot of people out there were disappointed that, you know, Trump doesn't isn't being subject to asset seizures and forfeitures and whatever. But, you know, that's a long and brutal process and would take a long time and it'd be expensive for both sides. And it's, uh, if I were, as I said last week, if I were in the state's attorney general, I'd be happy not to be engaged in that litigation, which is costly, time consuming and, and, and a pain. The only and, thing that bothers me about this is that I would have liked to have seen Trump says he has the money. And I would like to have seen him pay it and not one of these Republican donors yeah, I mean, just maybe, like get him off the hook. If he had the money, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe he I, – I, I tend to credit that he couldn't get the, the $460 yeah. million dollar bond. Sure. I, I tend to credit that but because um, I don't think he had that much in liquid assets. No, but assets. I think he had 175 Yeah, and I think that's the reason why he was able to get the bond. Yeah, okay. Okay, so All it's right. sort of, it's sort of circular, but I don't know where how the court the the appellate division first department, which is the appellate court that is, that cut the bond requirement down, came up with the one seventy five. But you know, I, it's one hundred and seventy five million dollars that the state will not have to work for if it obtains an affirmance of the judgment. Um, you know that that of of, of at least one hundred seventy five million dollars. I mean, it's possible the judgment gets cut. We will see. Okay. So I also want to get into just very quickly uh, that a California court recommended that John Eastman be disbarred. Uh, and while that decision is on appeal, Eastman cannot practice law in the state of California. Right. Who's hiring that guy anyway? But the opinion said that Eastman conspired with President Trump to obstruct a lawful function of government of the United States, specifically by conspiring to disrupt the electoral count on January 6th, 2021. This is amazing to me how a bunch of people who tried to overturn the election with Trump, are facing actual accountability, yes. including the people who stormed the Capitol yeah. who were in jail, but not Trump. Yeah, and 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 we've we are seeing we've seen these disciplinary proceedings or sanctions proceedings against lawyers proceed. I mean, you, we saw Jenna Ellis and Rudy, and now this was the this is actually the most severe thus far. Uh, Rudy was uh, Rudy Rudy lost is going to lose his license. I think um, this is. Look, the, the, what's what's amazing about this is this is essentially a facti- factual finding after a full trial that Eastman conspired with Donald Trump to commit crimes. I mean, we had, remember, we, during the January 6th uh, hearings, the January 6th committee litigated some attorney-client privilege issues with Eastman and got a federal district judge in California to hold that the documents that Eastman had, even if they involved communications with Donald Trump, m- many of them um, were exempt from protection under the attorney-client privilege because um, they were in furtherance of a crime. I mean, here we have a full-fledged finding after a trial, and this is essentially the kind of evidence, the kind of case that, um, that, that Jack Smith will have to put on in, here in the district uh, when, when, the, when the case comes back to Judge Chutkin, which I think it will, in the, in the January 6th or the, the election. That the, is truly an election interference case. Yeah. Yeah. So you think Eastman loses his thing for... Yeah, I mean, Eastman now has been, you know, he, he has been found by the state bar trial court to have engaged in conduct that makes him unfit to practice law. And and he can take that, um, he's suspended um, right now, and it becomes final if he does not appeal um, or if it is affirmed by the California Supreme Court. So what's going to happen is next is that he will file some kind of a petition for review 
in the Supreme Court of California, and I suspect the Supreme Court of California will at some point affirm, and he will never practice law in California Does that mean again. He can't become the head of the DOJ because I just like think when I think about Trump's cabinet, I always think Trump's going to take the people who tried to overturn the last election and like put them in charge of DOJ. Like, well, that's an interesting question. It's not clear that you that to be attorney general that you have to be a lawyer. There's no law that says that. Um, there would be a, you know, barely the attorney general doesn't have to be an attorney. I, I don't think that I, I don't think that the, that 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 there necessarily is a legal requirement that, that the attorney general you don't be think an it's attorney. Applied? No, I don't. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't think so necessarily it is. I mean, um, and um, what do I know? I know. I mean, there's always been this question about whether or not somebody who's not admitted to the practice of law in a particular. Um, district court can appear on behalf of the government, but usually they just get themselves admitted. I don't know. I, I mean, here, you know, Trump's going to do whatever he wants to appoint people. I don't know that he's going to appoint Eastman, but he's going to appoint somebody nefarious to be attorney general. Um, you know, no question about it. He's not going to appoint any of these guys who, no matter- Judge Cannon sounds like somebody who might be looking for a gig. Oh, God help us. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave it there. Yep. I'm going to leave it there. George, as always, thank, thank you. you for explaining the legal news to me. And thanks to everybody. For listening, don't forget to hit subscribe. Leave us a review on your podcast app. Email us at askgeorge at thebulwark.com. Get tickets for our live show on May 15th in Washington, D.C., and we will see you next week. Thank Bye. you very much. Well, George Conway, he's a man with a plan. Got to sit down with Sarah Longwell, take a stand, explain all the legal problems they're piling high. With Donald Trump, oh my, oh my, oh my. He said, Sarah, let me break it down for you. There's obstruction of justice, corruption to the legal tangles and troubles that are growing fast. It's a storm that's gonna last. And